Hey guys, so we're going to do a little subdivision modeling practice on a plane. And this is a great way to learn how to control your mesh and run your topology, how to do reductions, uh, redirections, things like that. So I'm going to turn on screencast operators. I have custom shortcuts that I use a lot, so it wouldn't help you much. But anything in green is a machine add-on. Anything else can be vanilla blender for the most part. And um, let's do it. So let's do a plane. And so a lot of times you're working on something and you just don't know how to run the topology, and that's where you run into the problems with subdivision surface modeling. So when you're working with planes, this is an excellent place to experiment and play around with ideas. Uh, you might be doing something like a firearm, and at the top of like a pistol, you might end up with a shape like this, where this is kind of cut out, right? Uh, where the, uh, the chamber is. So what ends up happening here is at some point it might go down. Maybe not even that far, maybe it goes down a little bit like that. Okay. Now, we have big end guns, and so this is why I emphasize blocking out a lot, because we're going to start to see here, as we work with this, that um, some things you might want to bevel, have three edges, and so we can subdivide it, hit Control 2, we can subdivide, right click, shade it smooth, great, but this is not subdivided the way we want, so let's turn off subdivision and edit mode, that little icon, and we have to figure out how to run this topology here. Now, you'd be safe to assume that you do some knife cuts, maybe down like this, and maybe take this one forward. All right, and then like this area, you're probably still like, oh, I don't know, maybe what do I do in this area? Well, this is where things get kind of tricky, for beginners especially, because there's a couple different ways you can hold corners. Uh, so like when you're doing a cube, we'll just use this area, for example. A lot of times you do a loop cut and a loop cut, and you might do your other loop cut there, so you get this topology here, right, in this corner. And that's what you're trying to achieve, so you can get a nice subdivision going in that area. You might have to add an additional loop, hold that in that area. Okay. And so, what ends up happening, though, oh, let's go back. I want that there still for a second. Okay. What, you, what you're doing, and you don't realize what you're doing, if we turn off optimal display, take a plane real quick, shrink it down. I'm going to turn it into a triangle. We'll subdivide it one time, right click, convert it to a mesh. Okay, so this is the topology here three quads and an end pole at the middle. End pole is a vertex with three edges coming out of it. Okay, these tend to pinch, but the reason I want to show you this is that's a subdivided triangle, right? And so look at this right here. That's the same topology. It's the end pull at the middle and three quads around it. So whenever you're trying to figure out how to subdivide triangles and things like that, just remember what subdivision is doing, for the most part, is it's doing something like a poke face, where if you take the face, you right-click and poke it. It does something like this, but it's also subdividing the edges, so it's putting a vertex out here, a vertex out here, and then it's smoothing it after with the Count Clark algorithm. And so if you wanted to we got to dissolve that a different way. Let's select this too. It's doing something like that, basically. So if you ever want to subdivide a triangle, that's what you do. Okay. But that's the same topology in the corner when you're using these kinds of loop cuts like this. And once you see it, you won't unsee it because it happens everywhere. It happens on an extrude, right? That's the same topo right there. Um, but it also happens with insets, right? And it'll do that number. And that's the same topo right there. Okay, now, so when you want to do things like redirects, get to that in a second. Bring this back up. So, like, you're running a edge this way. You don't want it to go around here, but maybe you want it to stop short. You redirect it to this direction. Well, that's the same topo, right? That's the quarter inset, basically. And so that's something you could do. Now, you'll see this pop up time and time again in all kinds of different scenarios. Some guys will do what's called a 3 to 1. They cut this here, and you cut forward to where you want to reduce. That's a reduction method as well. This is two quarter insets, or half inset. And so we can turn that whole section into a, uh, a single edge from the, uh, what was the 3, right? So just keep that in mind. Three edges, or four edges, or whatever. Three faces. So it turns into one big face down here later on. Anyway, so... Don't forget you can vertex snap, that's useful. And you want to take something like this and just extrude it and snap it. So hold control to snap, A, and merge. Done. So we have that edge there now. 
and uh, we can work with that. Whenever we see something like this going on over here, we can say like maybe we want an additional edge here. This is a quad, okay? And that subdivides, especially if we have the holding edge here. So what we'll see is that it's actually creating that little corner, right? Even though it's set up like that. Kind of a hard one to understand perhaps, but basically think of it like this. Uh, if this whole area looks like this again and we inset it, you see how they want to converge? If we keep going, they'll cross each other. Right here. So we can take those and merge them. Control X. That's the same topo. All right. So little things like that go a long way. When it comes to modeling anything. And it, but that's not the only way to hold a corner. This one's a little bit different, right? These corners generally they want to go out something like this. Not always the case. Sometimes you can still use quads. Like sometimes. Um, you might not do it like this, but you might want to do a, an edge out to something like that, but I want like a holding edge around here. So we're already looking at what, what we're going to need, which is maybe like a um, an inset of sorts, right? And then that'll run all the way through. And that might go to somewhere right there, and then we might need another edge going out these ways. We're just going to cut this all up manually. This is what we're looking at. Well, what about these guys here, these ones? Can sometimes get away with just shifting them forward like this but that's not necessarily always the way it should be because you need three edges to hold this corner uh, so sometimes you got to balance it and pull these back perhaps when you do that you'll start to see that this is the kind of corner you're looking to create here we add a loop cut here and that subdivides you get this now notice this here is called an e-pole it's a single vertex with five or more edges coming out of it um, Usually e-poles and in-poles, you don't want them in the, on the edge itself. You want to push them off to the side. In this case, it's up on top. It goes out there when it subdivides, right? And the same can be said in a lot of other areas on edges. But these corners, the in-poles actually work out pretty well in the corner there. So we can go through. We can press J, subdivide. We can do this. Join these two together, perhaps. This as well. So we add that little loop cut there to kind of hold everything into position. And maybe we can tighten up that corner. You can see we created that almost diamond looking quad there. But that's the same topo. The three ed the three quads with the end pole. But the end pole is up here, so it's not going to look bad. So you have to shift that end pole around sometimes. Sometimes it helps to reduce things. Um, sometimes you got to add additional edges to hold things in place. All kinds of little fun stuff like that. And this is why the plane is so good, because now you're starting... To work with not just a um, a plane, but you're you're able to turn it into a 3D mesh and start to figure out what's going on here, like how you can work with it. And so, just because we know kind of what occurred over here, if you inset this whole face, now you can start exploring the idea of using uh, things like insets. And you'll see it already kind of starts us off in the right direction. You have the sidewalk going around. You have a sidewalk mostly going around over here, except it kind of redirects right here this way, right? And so. When we start adding our additional cuts, basically the same thing will occur here. Or something very similar anyways. So we'll do that cut out. That cut out. Okay. That one going. We'll probably have to work that edge here in a sec. This is going to keep running. This is going to be a flow that goes just like the other one, but they go to each other, right? So these ones will come down and merge to this possibly. Balance it out. This one doesn't need to exist. Get rid of that one. After we cut through. That doesn't need to exist. Now, that's, that's kind of the easiest way to do this, or explain this, I think. You can extrude. You can snap, right? You're going to snap to whatever the closest vertex is. Do it in edit mode. Snap it in object mode kind of stuff. Let's just say uh, a known thing about Blender. Hold control and snap around. These two, press A, N, merge by distance, press F. All right, so we can start cutting this up in, in our appropriate manners anyway. So you can see here, this is not the exact topo we want. It's in setting. So our loop or our edge flow is going this way. We want it to go straight down this way. So cut what you need sometimes. No matter what topo you already have, just cut what you want it to do and then start figuring out how to make that occur. That could go a long way as well. Because uh, we might not need that edge at all. 
So that goes all the way back down here. These ones come over here. I'm going to run them down. We're going to have to think about balance later on, perhaps. You can see this is a higher resolution here in this section compared to this section over here. And by resolution, I just mean like, uh, you know, face density, basically, so or vertex density. So uh, you can increase resolution later on. But as you increase resolution, those little rectangles become more pronounced. Sometimes you don't want to do that because you might want to sculpt on this thing, especially if you're doing like characters. Or you might have to do like a shrink wrap or all kinds of other little things that could come up. Just keep that in mind that you might not always get away with uh, cramming the edges with detail. And what I mean by that is like if we subdivide heavily, we zoom out a little. You see how like this is all becoming dark black, but this is still clearly visible little quads everywhere. That's just the uh, the density in these edges is a lot sharper. There's a lot more of it, which is good in some cases and bad in others. But you have to figure out what your needs are for your model, and then you're trying to balance that kind of stuff out. Generally speaking, usually. Now you can do that with creases and whatnot. I'm trying to check this. Thing. I think we might have missed something. Sometimes you got to add creases if you want to um, work with really simple mesh, but you don't want to add additional holding edges. Like you don't want to bevel this corner in this manner. Keep that in mind. This whole bottom section, if it's set up correctly, we should be able to select it, align it with our machine tools, align top. All right, so that could be like one uh, piece, right? That could be like a piece of a pistol, perhaps. You can see this is not going to be held quite as sharp as we want, so double it. This corner we didn't finish, technically. So I'm going to press E, do a loop cut, and then hit E and F. Let's do this number like that. That one, E. You can see this one might not work out like that, so we're just going to move it over. Like that. We could do this one like that too. Line it to the left with machine tools or press S, Y, 0. Something like that now. So those will hold out a little bit sharper. Sometimes, even if you have an edge like this, you'll see like. The um, topology to turn on optimal display. This face might start being pulled this way when we want it to stay over here. So we do a loop cut here, maybe a couple here. So we're trying to create perfect little squares. And this is just generally going to keep your mesh from shifting around too much. If you have to do this, you have to do it, unfortunately, but it might be a thing. Here's a reduction for these three right here. Merge them. If you want to do that, you could on that particular shape, particular area. Um, and then as a result, I can control X and dissolve selection there. Dissolve that. That's a quad. The end pole is up here, but there's three quads. Sorry to see that pattern repeating. It looks a little bit different compared to this one, right? But it, it exists everywhere. Absolutely. That's one way you can do that. Now, the only problem is that those redirect as well, right? So our topology is going to redirect right there. May, may or may not want that. It's up to you. You turn it back into quads if you need to. Um, and if you did have it in quads, let's go back and see if we can cover it. If you did have it all in quads still, more than likely you can start pulling these apart. And you can try to balance this a little bit more. It's not always going to occur where you can get it like perfect. You might still have to have like another loop cut or something. But a lot of times you can balance these out a little bit numbers like this as much as possible kind of relief or relieve the uh, tension in that area perhaps a little bit throughout that face so uh, this does come into play with your shading actually so if we take a look we're going to use you could use a car paint one i have one that i've just made not well i made some time ago but like a glossier white it's a different type of glossy white. There's another van I, vanilla blender has this glossy white you can use. But I like this one because I got like a little lime in it. Uh, but basically, we can see where it's like super flat and the normals are behaving really well. That line doesn't change shape, right? Uh, whenever you start encountering certain types of topology in certain areas, you can see it starts to either get cut off or it flattens or it'll do some weird stuff sometimes, right? And this is one of the downsides of um, subdivision modeling. Believe it or not, it's one of the least accurate forms of modeling. 
using standard polygonal modeling with a lot of vertices, a lot of faces, can technically be more accurate than what we're doing right now with the uh, Catmore Quark algorithm. But um, other than that, you'd have to go to like CAD software to get more accuracy, right? So it does tend to deliver nice looking results, but it doesn't necessarily deliver, deliver the most accurate results. Um, and as a result of that, um, sometimes it can be a little bit frustrating when uh, you just get into sub D modeling. But this is a great way to learn how to control these meshes. And then you start to figure out like how to, you know, keep working things basically throughout the process of uh, doing this. So you can see I extruded that, but it's not snapped in the way I want. Let's right up here. Yeah, too close to that vertex. It's based off your mouse position. So if you're near this vertex or near this vertex, it's going to snap at that one. So like you can see if I go to this one, I press G and hold control. Oh, I use the top one. Go down and below it, G, hold control. <laughs> okay, I guess we're not going to have any luck with that, but usually that's what it's supposed to do. It, like I said, blender snapping is a little off sometimes, a little weird. So we make that the active element. And for whatever reason, it decided to stop working. Uh, but when you use active element, so you shift double click something, it'll highlight. That's your active element. And you don't use this one, sorry. We'll go back to medium point. We'll use this drop down vertex active right there. We were using closest, but for whatever reason, it stopped working. So we can use active as well. Shift things around and make it all uh, start to work out here. So I want this to be brought all the way through. But I want this to align first, so I'm going to straighten this thing. Machine tools on uh, straighten, right? I can just kind of snap it around if needed. And that's just kind of a quick, easy way of doing patches and stuff like that. So if you have to do it, you have to do it. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to probably in this one here, it's just a basic idea of controlling your mesh as, as simple as possible, at least. We'll get into some more plane modeling later where we're going to do some more different type of... Uh, Layouts of mesh, anyways, they get a little bit more complicated, perhaps. Straighten those out, but you can see here we can do an inset, hit B, hold control, maybe we can push that in, right? But we need a boundary around this first or a sidewalk, so we hit inset, hit B, we do it again, and hold control, we do that number, that. Okay, you see how it's just this is kind of starting to look normal in here, not all out of control. Good thing. Uh, we could try doing some bevels. A lot of times I find myself just doing another inset right at the end. It gives us that kind of like in, inner side section right. But this one all the way around, we could probably bevel. bevel. And also, the bevel shape matters as well. You can see we're doing a 0.5 right now. But we can set this to 1, and that's what's called a Korean bevel. I don't know who came up with that, but I'm going to go with it. And so this could be quite useful to um, make edges look a little bit sharper. Okay, just so you know, that's a thing and it does exist. And um, yeah, for the most part, I don't think we have any major, major issues here. I might bring this one back this way a little bit. That. So this should round in this area. And we'll get that kind of result, right? So all of these are rounding now. And of course, we could have finished out the shape into the other direction, but that might just be part of a, like the, of a pistol, right? Like there might be just the section there. So as you continue through your process, you'll find other times you might need to do an extrusion, right? For another section, maybe this is all uh, Control Shift S. It's it's a uh, sheared. You might have to hit X, Y, or Z when you do Control Shift S. Maybe you got something like that going on. You need to add an additional loop cut down here, perhaps. All right. At a certain point, it's just going to keep rising in complexity usually, because I need an edge here for this section. Hold that section down. I can control that curve. But you can see now that runs all the way through the shape, right? And so this is where a lot of guys really struggle. Um, because they don't understand how to get something to loop all the way back around 
come back into itself, especially when you have asymmetrical objects. Uh, it can really throw you for a loop, right? So, that out of the way, though. We're starting to get the idea, at least, of what's possible when it comes to the basic forms. And um, so we need to hold that sharp. We can loop cut that way. Um, I think I messed this up somehow. <laughs> I don't know what I did here. I extruded this edge. Didn't I? This one. Maybe like that. So we might need another loop cut here. Take a look. There's an in pole, or excuse me, e pole right here in this corner. Sometimes you have to do this because this edge wants to go this way, that one wants to go that way, and this one's going to go wrap around that way. This can work in these areas. It might get a little bit soft, but having a pole on an edge usually is inadvisable, but these e poles, sometimes you have to do this, right? So just keep that in mind. So all around, not too bad. And we can figure out how to reduce this stuff later on as well. So for example, we merge these three, control X here, we might just do something like that too, because we have these all these edges running backwards, back down that direction. Maybe we don't want that many going in that direction. So we merge them, creates one edge going out in that direction, resolve that. We still have quads here, but we've converted that corner or that edge to look a little bit different, right? And so when we take this and um, eventually we snap that down there, perhaps. What I just did, let's do, let's go back to closest for a second. Snap that out of that way. Trying to figure out which one I need to get rid of. Alt middle click, by the way, will let you kind of look at different areas of your mesh. So if you alt middle click and gesture, while moving, you can jump into the side views. Got stuck for some reason. Which I don't know. Also, tilde key has the menu, so you can view selections as well that way. So, if I want to grab like this vertex and view the selection. It'll be <laughs> like no fighting with that. So that section here, we might not even need that all the way around. Oh, we kind of need it in this corner. So yeah, maybe we do keep that one, maybe we don't. We'll have to figure that out later, but we could have reduced this area if we wanted, right? So, need a holding edge at some point. Oh, wait a second. It creates an in because of that one. I can't do a loop cut. So we might pull that forward, that. A couple loop cuts later. You do this at the end. If you don't need them right away, don't use them. You might just do like this one holding loop here. You see it still pulls back pretty far though. Maybe add a couple in there for now. You don't want to overcomplicate your mesh when you don't need to, basically. And if you have to have certain things in certain areas to, you know, have them precisely line up with each other, this can become more complicated perhaps. So like if this one's on X here, let's see where our origin point is center here. Okay. If we take the X value, we can actually take like say maybe this edge and we paste that X value in here, but we set it to negative. And now we have those um, evenly spaced apart from each other. So for whatever reason, if we had to do an inset here, inset again and hold control, push that down. If we had a shape like that we needed to cut. You can see, well, balances everything here for these so uh, aligning them up copying the values pasting the values make sure it's not negative and you can see we can space those appropriately it's going to hold that shape there now right so we go through this whole process through the whole mesh having this many running across here is um, kind of bugging me right now so you might want to try doing like three to ones on stuff like this potentially. But like I said, add these additional elements later on. And if you see if I do that one, deal. Spacing these out as well. Can space using uh, loop tool space. And it's just grab your maximums there, like from one end to the other. And you can see it's going to even it all out as well. 
that's a fun way of doing that if you needed to. But you see that obviously starts to pull the top in faster than the bottom. So that might not be something we want to do here right now anyways. Uh, but yeah, we can keep going. Doing all kinds of little edits. One thing I do want to mention is when you try to shear something or um, whatever the case, like move it out a little bit, and you've already done a bevel or you have your holding edges, sometimes you have to redo them. In this case, I think we'll be okay. You can get a little bit of taper there. But you can start making big edits to big chunks of the mesh if you needed to. And it actually gets kind of wild because you could use proportional edit um, maybe set it to connected only in some situations. And so you can actually do like big edits like this potentially as well. Um, a good subdivision mesh generally, not always, but um, a lot of times it'll be very easy to deform it, right? And it'll be, it won't always necessarily work out, but you should be able to deform them fairly easily. And you can see, like, it's not going to look too bad that way. So this is going to get to that next kind of step in subdivision anyways, where we're able to create more organic forms, more curvy shapes. It's a lot of fun, but it, uh, it does take a little bit of skill to learn how to do that. Because maybe this chamber is just really weird for some reason. So you can do things like that. A lot of times the chambers kind of go down a little bit. Anyways, turn proportional edit off. You don't always need it on. See there. Almost worked out, except this here, we would have to redo the top of this area. That's not going to work. That would probably end up being a bunch of quads in here instead with uh, straight, straight edges through it. I had to take a guess. We want to try something. We could do K, X, and C. Now do um, Y. And we'll go all the way out on Y. Uh oh, it's kind of shifting it. So if we do that like that, this also might be useful because that one we were just doing. It should work out better, I think, if it was like that. Yeah. So sometimes you might want to switch that back and forth between the two. There are times you have to use that, like I said, that e-pole on an edge. So the impulse and the e-poles are your big indicators on if your mesh is working correctly. You shouldn't see them kind of randomly throughout your shape. They should be kind of in the corners or on the tops here, on the tops of the hard surfaces, like that. On characters, they can go anywhere. They kind of show up wherever they want. Um, but if you look at other people's meshes that have done characters, you'll see a lot of times they're like um, an in pole might be near the nose. That's what they call it, the nose pole. Or they might have like an E pole on the cheek or near the cheek, things like that. So once you start looking for those, you'll start to understand like how the mesh is kind of working. Uh, in a nutshell, and you don't want dense patches usually. And we have a random hole here because of that cut that didn't go all the way through. So if we finish that cut, get rid of that pole right there, and then that'll be like that. Now, also, this density having this random dense patch here and not very dense here when you're doing top of the top subdivision modeling where it's going to animate and deform and all that you can't do that okay? it has to be evenly balanced throughout the shape you're going to start using creases probably for that um, or you're going to have to subdivide a very simple mesh first and then go back and optimize it later on so you do like a level one subdivision then you apply it go back and tweak everything so it's really nice and clean and then um, you can keep working on it from there possibly or you can go to like multi-res and start sculpting on it perhaps at a really high resolution, so you can do technically like a um, a really clean mesh or somewhat like the base of a low poly and then use a multi-res or the uh, extreme high detail as well. Sculpt on it, so all kinds of little fun things to consider, but overall, just playing with these ideas can go a long way. Now, one thing I do want to mention though is that 
Um, you will eventually at some point probably start splitting your mesh up. And so if I was to just grab some shape here and remember. I've shown this in another video, you Alt S, you can kind of squeeze these in. So when you split mesh up, like think of it like this when uh, you're something made in, in the real world, it's made in multiple pieces and parts, right? You're usually trying to create your models in that same manner. Okay. And so a lot of times you're gonna have to split things up later on. And hiding a split in a scene can be useful, obviously. Uh, we can do select loops and do loop inner region. They'll select this small side here. But if we do select bigger, we can do that side as well. Right? So we can split this. All right. And when we split this, one of the first things we're going to notice, first of all, is that we can Alt-Q between them. I'm going to bevel this at you. Um, but we're losing some shape here. So a lot of times you can actually select the whole boundary loop. It's also up here, select loops, uh, boundary loop. All right, so you press A, select boundary loop. Um, you can set creases to one on this, and that's just gonna hold everything into position. Now, normally this works out fine. Sometimes it won't, but sometimes you might have to uh, take your mesh up a resolution, apply like a level one subdivision and then split it. But this is generally something you can do at least. So if you, if you want like a different colors here or something or different, uh, you can basically split it down into different parts and pieces uh, later on and get some really clean results out of it. But the main thing is, is that once you've done this, uh, you don't want to mess with the borders, basically, right? That's kind of, they're like, they're off limits. You want to have them kind of match each other. They don't have to necessarily match perfectly, but... They should match each other for them, right? And so we can also use our sculpting tools at some point. Right now we're using subdivision modifier, which is preferable, generally speaking, in my opinion. But um, multi-res is great if you're going to start sculpting. But you can't use a sub-D and a multi-res together, or Blender scene will, like, crash and wake out and have errors. But um, on one mesh anyways, you can use one or the other. Use multi-res, you can subdivide with it, take it up in polygon count. And uh, you can go into sculpt mode. I just want to point this out real quick. Um, you can lock up here at the top, topology, face sets, mesh boundary, and uh, face sets boundary as well. Because if we go into edit mode now and we want to work in a specific area, let's say we're going to sculpt something that's more like a, uh, a biomech or something like that. Some kind of organic design uh, mixed with a hard surface. Uh, we can do an edit mode selection, go back to sculpt mode, go to face sets. And we can initialize a face set from edit mode. And that doesn't look like much until you realize you can press H and you can hide face sets, right? And just work on one section at a time. And so you can sculpt on this as well, which is fun. So if you want to sculpt something, you could. You have hard surface alphas. Let me show you how to set one of those up properly real quick. Uh, basically, if you don't have this add-on, this is called Sculpt Alphas Manager add-on. Um, it's useful, but... At the same time, it sometimes causes problems. You're going to create probably a new uh, texture here, right? Set it to area plane, new texture, and we go to our texture panel. We open up an alpha. So in my case, I got a textures folder with a bunch of alphas in it. Go to general. Well, not a lot, but just a couple for now. So let's say we do this one here. We got the alpha. You have to change the mapping on these to be clipping, right? And then your brush, you do area plane, stroke, you can change to whatever you want, but I'm gonna use anchored. Okay, and the fall off I set to constant, and that's it. So now I can press Shift F, change the strength, and you can see it's a little bit low res right now, but basically we can use this shape if we wanted to, and if we need to subdivide more, we can. But we're trying to get it to preserve the detail. So you don't always have to detail with like decals or uh, you don't have to detail by modeling everything necessarily. You can go into sculpt mode at some point and do this. So that's going to save you a little bit of a headache. And you can create a high poly that way. Uh, no problems for the most part. You can also reduce the preview size. So that way when you're working on other segments, um, you don't have to worry about having this eat all your performance up because I have low VRAM. You'll probably have low VRAM. Well, some of you might have low VRAM. And um, so just 
turning that down to zero even might be useful or like level one or two or something so you can bake well you can try to bake this from cycles under cycles you can do baking and you'll see you can bake from a multi-res but you only get two options normals and displacement um, personally i'm not too impressed with that i was playing around experimenting with it it does work but it's it kind of bakes that base mesh so if you're doing like a preview level one but you're doing bakes at six or whatever it's going to bake that mesh and kind of like the low poly and the high poly together and so you don't really get a lot of flexibility out of it for the most part because it's kind of a little weird the baking in blender anyway so but it's possible right. now you can go through this whole thing have a lot of fun with it turn off the display back on and gotta uh, you know work out your mesh and see what you can get going uh, one last thing I want to mention, though, is that when you are using a multi-res, make sure if you're going to do something symmetrical, you turn on symmetry and you have your origins point, uh, placed appropriately because you don't really get another like opportunity to go back and uh, tweak those things a whole lot. So I don't know why I just did that for. These aren't connected. Let's press J. Must have dissolved it by accident. But anyways, so there, there's a couple options there for you, but when you're sculpting at least, one other thing I kind of failed to mention here. Under brush, every brush you're going to have to do this where you do front faces only. Okay. And so anything that's really thin, if there's like a backside to it, if you don't have front faces only on, there's a good odd chance you're going to like pull that mesh all the way through. Is something that happens. Um, and then so between that front faces only and topology here, it usually works out just fine. Now, if it doesn't, your brush is too big, generally speaking. So with all that out of the way, you can see we get sculpt on it. I'll even mention that there's an eraser, the multi-res eraser. You can use that, right? I, I might have mentioned that. I don't know if I did. But let's see what else we got in here. Mesh filter can be quite useful. We can do things like inflate, smooth, relax, surface smooth, um, sharpen, and enhance details as well. This thing's pretty cool, uh, so you can utilize that. The smooth tool itself, also, it's using Laplacian smoothing by default. You could try surface smoothing. This can be useful sometimes, but you have to basically, like, if you click and drag, it doesn't do a whole lot. It's basically click multiple times. You might turn the strength up, but shift F there. And it's just going to try to smooth out the surfaces while maintaining the volume for the most part. That's what it's going to do. It doesn't always get it right, but it tries. That's the main thing. So, anyways, uh, with that out of the way now, I don't want to do a whole sculpting thing here, but. It's really useful, at least for hard surface stuff, when you're just doing scrapes, for the most part. So the fill tool has a scraper in it, by the way, so you can hold control and scrape with it. And when you want to do like little um, damage to the edges and stuff like that, take your time with this. Use a little strength if needed, and uh, just kind of work it as needed. You got to do a couple passes to it. But anyways, that'll give you that kind of like triple A final touch there. Almost like you're using ZBrush now, right? This is kind of an older method of sculpting, by the way, where you have to make perfect mesh and sculpt on it. Uh, but that out of the way, right, there's one thing I keep forgetting. I keep forgetting what it is, though. All right, we'll go. It's in sculpt mode. That's what it is. It is the tools themselves or the tool panel. This little option here, I don't know if it exists up here. I haven't notice if it does this little brush icon all right if you turn this off basically like sometimes you might be using a crease tool and you want it really small so you can do little crease lines or whatever um, but then you want to use a smooth tool and you want it really large or something right so you can do large smooths and so all this does is when you uncheck that it allows them to stay independent right so one will be large one will be small and so to me this is quite useful um, when you're working with all the, the sculpting tools. Also, if you're going to use a tablet and you want to, uh, like, it, rotating like this is fine for the most part, working on a lot of things, but if you're using a tablet with a pen, sometimes you need to adjust the canvas or the uh, the model so that you can match your wrist motions and all that. Um, under Preferences, Navigation, there's Trackball Method. All right, Trackball Method is going to make it behave something like ZBrush now. Where you can see we can kind of go back and forth and around like this, but we can spin as well, right? 
So if you grab onto the sides, it spins it more. In the middle, it tends to rotate more. And so if you need to do that, you can do that. It's quite useful. Anyways, so all in all, that's pretty much it for this video. Just wanted to kind of give you a taste of working with some basic mesh and trying to finish out the corners and do the different little sections like that, but also talk a little bit more generally about the uh, the tools here. That's really what this video is about. So once you understand these kind of ideas, it's, subdivision doesn't become too hard. Practice, though. Make a shape that's really simple, and then just practice subdividing it. Before you know it, you're able to cut things like this apart and figure out like little sections to do and um, how you can make them more interesting later on, perhaps, because you know maybe you want to take something like this here, or maybe just this edge even. You just want to pull it down or something. Like you can do this kind of stuff later on and get more interest out of your models. And that's part of like the design process. So if you wanted to, you could. You see it's not balanced across, so it kind of looks a little weird. Also, I might want to take these ones and scale those instead. And we can also introduce the idea of creasing more edges as well. So if we want to do like 0.5 here. That. All the way to the back, perhaps. So we can get some really minor adjustments going that really kind of fill out the rest of the shapes here. Do one more, and we'll call this video after that. You can see, not symmetrical, though. Obviously, that's a little bit of an issue. Anyway, so all in all, hopefully at this point, you can kind of see what happens here. You can see my um, seam is wrecked now because of that, but we probably want to do that more appropriately later. Anyways, that's it for this video, guys. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will check you out in the next one, all right? Take care.